Hello, everyone. I am so excited to have this conversation with these two incredible minds. Um, Deepak, the co-founder of Never Alone, our mental health initiative of the Chopra Foundation, where we truly believe that we need to reach a critical mass to transport global transformation into overall well-being. And I believe, and we believe, that mental health is actually at the center of overall well-being. And as our guest here today, we have Dr. Lena Hussein, who's a psychotherapist, and she's particularly specialized in supporting survivors of sexual abuse because of her very personal story. And we will be getting into the depth of the storytelling to actually raise awareness and stop this practice. Um, this is in, um, this is to celebrate or this is to raise awareness. I don't know what the right word would be, Leila, and you would need to, you know, inter <laughs> intervene here. But it's on the occasion of February 6th, which is a zero international day of zero tolerance for female genitalia mutilation. So we want to get to the crux of the story. Um, Leila, I'm just an I'm, I'm an admirer of yours. You're you're just a brilliant woman. Uh, when I met you on the virtual stage of the UN conference for the Girls Up campaign, I was just blown mm -hmm. away by by your your light, first of all, um, your story and your resilience. And 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 ending violence against women and girls has been uh as to those who know, uh, who are listening, has been a, a, a real pursuit of mine, because I believe that if we do not stop this cycle of trauma and abuse, then the world is just going to be a constant inflamed um, story of these traumatizing circumstances that recycle through our DNA and generation to generation. So if we can be the actors of change and it stops at people like us, then we're doing a big favor for our children's children. And Layla, when I heard you, I was just blown away. I was like, I love this woman. She, and I love her already. <laughs> And I feel that she's on a mission, which is a selfless mission. You know, it's a dangerous mission to take upon a subject like FGM. So Leila, um, please share the why, the how. I don't like using these words, but you are an FGM survivor because I, I believe in, mm -hmm. in beyond the surviving, you know, I like going beyond, but this is a mm -hmm. word that needs to be used. You are an FGM survivor. So please mm -hmm. share the why, the how, and then we're gonna bring in consciousness and healing into this conversation and our solutions. Yeah, thank you. And by the way, Gabriella, I felt everything you said about me is how I felt about you. And it, that's what's <laughs> interesting is you and I have not even met in person. I actually I thought about that. It's like we know each other for nearly two years, but we never met which proves the amazing human connection we made over a screen in another big conference. So I am so happy that I'm here. Thank you. So just to begin, I am, I, am, I, I am a survivor of female genital mutilation, but I think also it's important to clarify survivors of female genital mutilation are also survivors of sexual assault because touching a child's genitalia is a form of sexual assault. And when you use uh, instrument, whether it's a blade or a knife, is a serious sexual assault. So I really want to begin with by calling it for what it is, because as a, as a survivor myself, as a psychotherapist who's worked with women who've undergone FGM, one justice we can give those women is actually calling it for what it is. Because historically, when we talk about this issue, we're not using the right language. We keep calling it traditional harmful practice, cultural practice. It's not. It's violence. It affects children, uh, mainly affecting African, the African black child. And, and that, that's how it has to be framed. I'm actually sick and tired of tiptoeing around this. And I think that's always been my mission. My mission has always been, we need to recognize this for what it is because then we can all, we, we're very clear on how to deal with it. We know how to deal with children who are being abused. But when we constantly framing it in a way that like, demonizes and minimizes the experience it's is we, we can never solve this problem so I just want to begin with that that this that is, is violence against children. so so fascinating actually and I almost want to ask Deepak just quickly before we continue Deepak isn't that interesting that the the, the distinction right that has created um uh, the also the stigma around the FGM is there anything that you want to add on the use of language and how consciously one has to use language to create distinction and diffuse trauma and also empower yeah what Leila 
as said, is very uh, appropriate. You know, it's sexual assault on a child, but it's also uh, very dangerous as uh, as uh, a biological violation. So we know, uh, mm -hmm. for example, that uh, FMG can uh, be associated with with immediate health risks, including hemorrhage and bleeding and shock mm -hmm. and infection, HIV transmission, uh, urine retention, severe pain, mm -hmm. and uh, adulthood uh, can, can the consequences can be uh, infertility. It's amazing that you you have survived and you have had two pregnancies, but I'm sure the, mm -hmm. even the vomiting is part of the trauma. You know that you had absolutely 100 and mm -hmm. so there are many other things you know it can lead to postpartum hemorrhage it is known to lead to stillbirth and um, even um, what we call neonatal death so just from a medical point of view this is um, inflicting trauma to a child that has long-term physical consequences and and of course, long-term mental consequences. It's a violation of human dignity. It's a violation of human, um, um, it's gen not just gender violation. It's, you know, when you violate a person to that extent by removing partially or all of their uh, external genitalia, the long-term consequences and then as you mentioned uh, now that we know so much about epigenetics and intergenerational trauma uh, i think we have to be straightforward this is a medieval practice uh, very frequently um, the excuses that is sanctioned by religion but you can find no reference in christianity or islam that actually sanctions this practice mm -hmm. so uh, you know we are living in in the 21st century right now uh, with medieval medieval mindsets and this is a very dangerous combination and it's about time that everybody stands up to it all of us not just women but men across the world in everybody. fact i was reading some surveys most men in africa that i saw in the surveys are against this practice so the reason mm -hmm. we are having this conversation is if we expand the conversation, the first thing you have to do is expand awareness, because if you're not aware of a problem, there's no solution. And then you need actually this conversation to reach critical mass. You need the support of organizations like UNICEF and the United Nations. You need the support of uh, medical um, organizations. And you need a global outcry against this extremely violent i can't think of a more violent practice uh, against children but, but thank oh, you i thank you deepak <laughs> i couldn't agree more and um... i you have you have no i you have no idea just just that last point that you just made i i'm shocked and horrified that we're not outraged i actually all i want from all of this is just an outrage because you know girls like myself when i you know the seven-year-old layla needed someone to scream and shout and say, how dare anyone do this to her? And, you know, right now, actually in Kenya, December and January, just, we just, we're just coming out of the, the high risk months because, you know, girls have been off school. This is the cut, they call it the cutting season. Oh God. So we're in the midst of it as we speak, you know, it's every five, so every six seconds, a girl is being mutilated in this continent. Three million will be mutilated. Um, this in this continent and what worries me since COVID it's gotten worse because FGM is very much connected to economics so COVID people lost their jobs meaning girls are now being given away as a gift to other families at wow. a very young age so again I, I don't like using the term marriage because marriage again it's something that two people consent to I hate the term child marriage I think that's not okay because then somehow we kind of coercing ourselves into the situation no child can ever be married so we have to call this for what it is it's kidnapping again it's an adult molesting a child those are the language again we need to keep using so it's not just fgm that happens here it's a combination and that leads to other forms of violence 
Um, so FGM survivors, that's not the first violence they experience. It leads to other forms of violence throughout their whole lives. And as Deepak you know, clearly described, the physical impact that happens afterwards, the psychological impact, and they have to live with that. I have to live with this for the rest of my life. I have to, I have to be very conscious and, 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 and be in a position to take care of myself at all times. I've accepted I will never have a smear test and have a, a, a lovely experience. My, my nurse always has to keep me calm and prepare me. And I, I, I know that's never going to happen for me. That's that I've accepted that, but it's not okay that it happens to another girl. It's, it's not okay to live like that all the time. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's fascinating when we're able to, uh, I, I keep on using the word language because I think language is actually language is the way we communicate right it's the way so we used we need to be very conscious of the words that we're using and the fact and i keep and actually i was talking about this deepak this morning actually on the other conversation we had we keep on labeling things and when we label mm -hmm. things we mm -hmm. create separation and when this separation That's creates we think that we're not part of this problem because there's a separation there and and actually you you know you're right this is not about fgm it is about kidnapping. It's about sexual abuse towards young children, and it's molestation. Absolutely. And and this is a that's, severe, that's is. a very severe consequence of. I mean, we can go into words that I I'm not going to use right now because it will derail the conversation. But it's a very severe con <laughs> a consequence of the collective consciousness of where we're at right now because we have to each and every one of us become responsible for one another. So if a girl Absolutely. is getting abused in Africa, I have to acknowledge that she is an extension of myself over there, you know? Absolutely. And it's not because Absolutely. I'm in the US that I am free of that suffering because we are actually a, a human, you know, humanity is a beating experience. We, our hearts are beating, we, we move. And so we need to raise awareness. We need to be outraged, but, you're, but we also need to add in the layer of 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 loving kindness and and quote unquote healing, which um, wow. is very important to this journey. Layla, you're as I said, you're my inspiration. Um, the journey started when you were seven years old. Um, can you just tell us, without going into too many details, but how you felt at seven, and and mm -hmm. what were the, the the journey points on your way? Now that you're forty two. What what ha what has been those key moments that you can share with us to help people understand yeah. that this is a long term commitment to self and humanity? Absolutely, I think it's important to understand. First of all, I think there's an assumption FGM happens to kids who are from impoverished backgrounds and parents who are not educated. I came from a very privileged Somali family. I was going to the best school. My mother was educated. My father was educated. Actually, my dad's family didn't practice it mm. uh, it was my mom's side of the family so he was actually out of the country when this happened my mom's way of it was very strange her way to protect us you know FGM is in different types there's type one which is pricking of the clitoris type two which is cutting the tip of the clitoris and putting two seat, two sutures on the on the small labia Type three, which is the one that's mostly practiced and the most horrific one is where they remove all the labia, the whole clitoris and the, the, the larger labia and they, the remaining skins pull together and stitch. And that's the one my mother experienced that was. So she felt maybe if I do the smaller one, it, it won't be that bad. It, it won't be that terrible. But we were not, because we grew up between Saudi Arabia and Italy, we just moved to Somalia. So we, me and my sister were the two, we didn't know about it. And, you know, one morning we wake up and I remember my mom used to host a lot of parties in the house. And I was like, that's interesting. Dad is not here. Why is mom hosting a party when dad's not here? I remember thinking that as a seven year old, just my body saying something is not right. I remember feeling that energy was different. And it was my neighbor's daughter who actually another nine year old told me what's going to happen to me. That's what's so horrible about this. A nine year old told me you must look forward to today because it's your special day. And I said, it's not my birthday. That was my actual response. And she said, no, 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 no. Today is your good name. Good name in Somali means FGM, but I didn't know what that meant. And then this nine-year-old proceeds to explain to me 
what was going to happen. And I was, and I was saying to myself, but mom told me no one should touch that part of my body. Why are, what, what, what's going on? And before I could think, I could hear my sister screaming in the other side of the house. So they were already mutilating her. And she's screaming for me and screaming for my mother. My mother's not in the house because usually when this happens, the mother's not in the house. And do you know why they keep the mother out of the way? In case the mother stops her child. Because if a mother hears her child screaming, she might intervene. So the tradition is the mother's kept out the aunties. So imagine a seven-year-old now who feels protected and loved by her mother now is put in this situation. Imagine now the impact that's going to have for the rest of your life. Because if that can happen to you in your own home, you now walk to every space, paranoid, worried, anxiety. So I know I've suffered from anxiety from that, from that moment because I didn't trust any space I walked into. Wow. And that was, that's, that's the experience that you have that day. But the impact, you know, and, and I agree with Deepak, my, my, this, my pregnancy has have been difficult because of that experience. And especially when you're dealing, the difference actually between here and, and my daughter was born in the UK, the UK, I was dealing with doctors and nurses who did not know my body. I'm a black woman mm. in a hospital. All the, all the medical professions are white. They don't know it. No one even asked me. They could see my scar, but no one said, hey, uh, you have a scar in your genitalia. No one asked. Literally, it was silence. So everybody pretended nothing happened. And that itself causes a lot of anxiety so you now I'm sitting there with my pregnant thinking oh so the baby's going to come out of here now no one gave me any support any advice so you can imagine the nine months of hell of going through this this time obviously after through my healing I luckily when I got involved in this work I had a very good manager at the time who said to me unless you go to therapy I cannot let you continue with this job and that's the best decision someone has ever made for me. Her name is Jennifer Bourne. And uh, she was a nurse I worked with in, in London in the African Well Women's Service who supported African survivors at the time. But she could see my trauma was really coming to the surface. Everything that was suppressed since I was seven is now coming to the surface at the age of 23, 24. So she insisted I go to therapy. And my first experience, I went to four therapists. I left every time they brought up my mother as an issue. I couldn't bear the idea that my mother's responsible for my problems I didn't want to admit it mm. imagine you now put in a position where you have to say oh shoot it was my mother because you know my mother besides that incident she was a lioness mother who protected her children but that moment it's what now is defining this person to me and therapy that's how I discovered well-being and therapy I mean I was going to therapy and I realized I mean the impact it's had on me and I was, wait a minute, I said, you know, the women who experience it might need us. It was the first time someone said to me, what you experienced was abuse. And everything finally made sense. My relationships made sense. My intimate relationships made sense because I could never trust somebody intimately. Mm. I just couldn't. You just can't trust somebody intimately. So that's what led me to the space of therapy. And I realized actually in the, in the anti-FGM space, everybody was focused on a physical damage than the psychological impact we were having. And that really where my work, that's why I, I, I was the first one to set up the first counseling service. It didn't exist. No one has ever written about how do we work with FGM survivors in the therapeutic space. I was the first one to do, and I trained, I mean, I've lost count of how many therapists in the UK I've trained in other parts of the world, but it was amazing to finally open that door for women to come in and for someone to say, hey, what happened to you was awful and it was abuse. You do need emotional support, which led me to my, you know, now 42. I've been coming to Kenya. I've been coming, I've, I've been back in Africa for a bit now for the last, I would say, 12 years. I've been coming back. And I really wanted to bring the mental well-being tools here because what was missing again, especially when we are in countries where again religion, patriarchy, somehow mental health is not talked about in that space. So I'm trying to find a way to bring, let's talk about, I go, hey, if we're going to look at physical health, we need to check our mental health. So that's how I really ended up working for the, I ended up coming to the girl generation. I really just wanted to build that emotional well-being tool, which now sits under everything, everything that we do in our work. And, and that's not just the women we work with, it includes the staff. 
because you know the staff hearing those horrible horrific stories it has an impact we a lot of my staff members are suffering from secondary trauma absolutely. compassionate fatigue it's there all the time absolutely and actually this is where our work comes in as the Chopra Foundation as Never Alone as Deepak's grand contribution to the world um, is is how do we teach take care of our overall well-being how can we explore this journey to self every journey matters your stories matter um, my story matters Deepak your story matters from the little boy coming from India mm -hmm. to work in your your first hospital and um, you know just outside of New York and you experiencing all of the you know the gunshots and that these different wounds and and your journey as a as a doctor so all of these stories matter but it's how do we transcend these stories so that we can become free free from suffering and I think that is the underlining um uh, message or, or journey that we're all sharing together, Deepak, because you're just a pool of wisdom and because you're you're so generous with your contribution to the world. Um, when you hear Layla and you hear her journey, which is almost a hero's journey, um, isn't it wonderful that she has, through her own journey, come to the, the the conclusion or the open conclusion that it is all about well-being that it is all about you know that it's not just a physical aspect of ourselves but it's the holistic aspect of ourselves that takes us on this journey and that we're all experiencing a form of you know burnout as quote unquote helpers social workers therapists people who want to commit to mm -hmm. this critical mass so Deepak please um uh, share not only your wisdom, your vision, uh, I'd love to hear your reaction to, to Layla's story, but also going into the later part of our conversation, what can we really do? What can we really do? In, I in think this, this is such a serious um, criminal offense. Uh, uh, Layla clearly outlined it, which is a sexual assault. So it should be treated as a criminal offense and it should be punishable. Uh, by law. That's the only way this problem will be solved. And that will require, I think, uh, a much bigger effort than just us having this conversation, because, you know, we can expand awareness. But ultimately, if we want to eliminate this uh, medieval barbaric practice, uh, we need to engage whole communities. That includes young people uh, with voice, uh, people who have been traumatized, the young people, but also their parents. Also, mm -hmm. you have to teach religious leaders because they have such a uh, important influence on mm -hmm. societies in Somalia, Kenya, etc. You have to engage activists, you have to engage medical personnel, you have to engage uh, educators and policy makers. So unless we have this kind of a overall uh, engagement in civil society, where you bring together uh, medical workers, mm -hmm. people traumatized, young people, parents, religious leaders, um, activists, and actually work towards the criminalization of this practice, um, it will continue unless it is actually criminalized as an offense, uh, same order as rape mm -hmm. or any other sexual violation. Mm -hmm. So that would be the first step. Mm -hmm. The second step, of course, is to see that, uh, you know, the trauma has to be approached at many levels. First of all, the physical injury. Secondly, what happens to people's self-esteem and uh, dignity. Uh, thirdly, uh, you know, uh, their emotional uh, healing, uh, which is a long-term process. And uh, fourthly, uh, help in alleviating both the physical and emotional pain. So that needs an entire group effort, you know, and in all the wisdom traditions, they say that if you have a community where we can exchange ideas and best practices for healing, if you actually involve that community somehow with some kind of spiritual practice or reflective inquiry or mindfulness or meditation, 
And if you also make service a component, these are Sanskrit words, seva service, sangha community, online and offline, and sadhana, some kind of spiritual, emotional practice. And then if you bring about in this effort, maximum diversity, a shared vision uh, where everybody also complements each other's strengths and some kind of emotional and spiritual bond, then we have a chance to change the story. And if you do this effectively, there's so many other areas that uh, need um, uh, to be addressed, including gender equality, racial equality. They're all linked, you know, so uh, social justice, economic justice, racial justice um, is all connected to our total overall health and well-being. As you know, the word health, healing comes from the word holy. And holy means all-inclusive, body, mind, spirit, and environment, and our ecosystems of relationship. So I, you know, I'm still kind of learning a lot about this practice and totally horrified that I was reading about 200 million people actually have been uh, violated in this way. And unless we do something, uh, it's going to continue. In fact, the figures for 2023 apparently uh, suggest that there are more people going to have uh, this uh, violation than in 2022. So this is a very important time to not only have this conversation but spread the word and harness the support of civil leaders activists community leaders governments united nations unicef all together uh, to actually as quickly as possible criminalize this practice legally that's my view deepak that's probably um the strongest uh, standpoint I've ever hear you speak upon. I'm, 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 and it's thank you, thank you for 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 being um, so bold in 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 what you're saying because uh, it's so easy. And Leila, you've experienced this way more than I have. Uh, it's so easy to tiptoe around everything because everything is contradictory, everything is in politically incorrect, and and this and that. And you know, sometimes you have to call a fact a fact. People are suffering, and this should not be done. Simple, you know. And and uh, Leila, do you have any more numbers yeah. to share with our listeners so that um, they understand more of the, mm. the, the extensive of this? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, you know, Deepak started with, you know, the 200 and the 200 million women are countries we haven't even counted yet. And, and those who are counted are ones who went to hospitals, came through a refugee camp. So you can imagine, you know, we live in parts of the world where people don't have IDs or, you know, you know, uh, hospitals. So no one even has, a, no one even counted those people. But FGM, it's a, it's a big global issue. We know now uh, I know there's research being done in Asia, and I think they're already estimating 150 million women in Asia alone. And we are talking about areas like India, Indonesia, Malaysia, in the Middle East, like Oman. There's a whole, there's a massive campaign happening in Oman. It's practiced in Saudi Arabia, in uh, United uh, um, United Arabs are also, uh, you know, it's also FGM is also practiced there. But now we are also finding out. We know there are cases in places like Guatemala, we heard uh, amongst the Mexican Mayan people. So what, in a way, the media and social media, as, as, as horrible as social media can be sometimes, is giving us a platform where we're now sharing this, where we're sharing these stories with other women. So it's not just African women. What mm -hmm. happened with African women is, it's so visible, people can see what's happening in Africa and there's been a lot of silence. And that's really where the concern has come. And then obviously we're talking about country communities who have now migrated to the West. In the US, I think it's 150,000 women. Uh, no, not 150, 500, half a million women in the US have undergone FGM. In the wow. UK, I think it's two, I forgot the stats. I think it was 150,000. And those are people they've counted through hospitals. Again, we are still not actually counting those numbers. And what you have to remember when in the US, is they're counting half a million women who have undergone. Those half a million women who have daughters are at risk. Mm. That's mm. what you have to remember. Yes. That they're at risk. When I was 
recognized as an FGM survivor, that one nurse, because you know, in the UK, it wasn't, we weren't even recorded to 2015. It was not on my medical notes that I've undergone FGM. That's where we were in the UK. Do you see when I say there's silence? And by the way, UN, UNICEF, they are talking about FGM, but it's still, it's still seen as a side issue. It's not seen as a wider issue. This is violence. You know, every, when you, when I go to a lot of meetings, people want to have a specific legalized crime against FGM. That's fine. I understand. But we already have laws that says you cannot harm a child and yeah, we must absolutely. use that law. Yeah. France, France is a great example. France doesn't have an FGM uh, uh, act. For them, it was very clear. You touch a child, you will be criminal. You, you have committed a crime. We, they said we don't need to. I remember we, I, 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 I did a, an e-petition during a documentary that I presented in the UK where I went after the UK government. When I say I did dangerous stuff, I went after the UK government publicly. Go, girl. <laughs> and there was an inquiry. There was, there was an inquiry launched against the UK government. So I've invited the French uh, prosecutors who prosecuted FGM cases to come and give evidence at this uh, inquiry. And, and the guys on the panel, again, it was all men on the panel, as you can see, asking about women's bodies. That was really interesting. And he said, you know, in France, you guys have convicted people. And she just looked at him and she said, we treat children equally. What are you guys doing? Wow. Why are you treating black children different in the UK? In France, children, we see them equally. You, heart, you touch a child, you scratch a child, it's abuse. And that's how we see it. And I wish, you know, the world could see FGM in that way. We, we've all signed to the UN Convention of Child Protection. We've, everybody has signed. I think the, only the US hasn't signed because the US has children on death row. That's the only reason the US has never signed. But the whole world has signed to this convention to protect children from harm. So all over the world, FGM is actually illegal. Harming children is illegal. But what we've done with this particular issue, we've separated it and we're using language like traditional harmful practice is a cultural practice. We must really like, I, I, it's, you, people don't understand how painful it is for survivors to constantly hear people negotiating their bodies with their community. So mm -hmm. people are constantly negotiating. My UK government's negotiating in Somali, people are negotiating, people are negotiating our bodies over and over again, instead of just saying, no guys, this is a crime, full stop. And look how it's happening globally. The harming of the black body, it's something that we see all the time. It's around us all the time. So FGM is just part of that. It's become so normalized, seeing black people being brutalized all over. It's, it's in our faces all the time. That's why no one's even paying attention to FGM because black children being brutalized, it's not, it's not something that we now flinch to. We don't because ah, it's just black kids. If FGM was affecting white kids in Europe, there will be an outrage. I can promise you that. I can promise you that. It, there'll be an, and we have to call it for what it is. That's what's really happening. Leila, this is so powerful because um, we're learning so much. Like Deepak said, we you know we're we're learning from you, and we're learning that you, we're learning about this 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 journey, and that by the way concerns so many over two hundred million uh, girls in the world and and women. So, I think um, next steps is this is the beginning of a of a of a larger conversation, but a larger movement. Um, Leila, to be very direct, what is missing right now? in the in today in this you 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 noted on the politics Deepak said we need a a collective emergence of different people from different sectors to kind of emerge together to create a collective consciousness that bu that bubbles so that we can create new ways and parve a new way and stop this you know archaic um system that we're thinking of separation as you just said but what what where are we at today um, what what is what is your what are your hopes? What can you see positive in the space, and 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 where do you think we can get? And then along that, I want Deepak to 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 also maybe just give us a little um, blessing on on how we can continue our mental health journey because this is mental health. It's emotional resilience. It's mental health. So Leila, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, my my hope is. 
that we were, I, I, it's, it sounds so crazy, but I just want people to know what, what's, what's going on. I know it sounds crazy, but I just want how you guys, you guys only heard about this, was it a year ago, two years ago? Yeah. I want the world to know what's happening to our girls. Look how, I, look how we freaked out when COVID happened. I just wish we had, like, if every five, six seconds a girl's being mutilated, we, I want, and we need outrage. And I'm saying this as a survivor. I'm not saying this as an activist. I'm saying this as a survivor. We deserve, we deserve outrage. We deserve justice. But fundamentally, we want to get to a place of love. Because, you know, I'm a great believer. Love, we, love is the answer. Love, love is what's going to heal us. But when you go through that kind of trauma, when you go through that kind of trauma, it's very hard to get to that space of love. I know that's where I am right now. Hence why I'm experiencing what I'm experiencing right now. I had to work to get to that place where I can finally love my body, love myself and accept. That's really all I want from all of this. And I want FGM survivors to feel loved and recognized and seen and they deserve justice and outrage. Beautiful. Thank you, Leila. Deepak. I think it's been said uh very eloquently by Leila and yourself. But uh, yes, uh, this is time to for the world to express their moral outrage at this. And uh, anyone who's not morally outla- uh, outraged uh, by what is happening, uh, their humanity is incomplete. So uh, what I would say is that uh, as we move forward, Uh, with this conversation, let's uh, not only express our outrage, but also take some action. And that includes speaking to legislators, speaking to community leaders, speaking to public in general, and then working towards um, a criminalization of child abuse, because that's what it is. And uh, it's a violation of every yeah. aspect of childhood from um, their dignity to their future their physical and mental health that's the first step and then you know there has to be action where we ultimately can get to is that uh, we continue our four practices um, which is we accept the situation as it is because without accepting it right now as it is we can't address it so we have to address that this is the situation as it is these are the statistics these are the people that have been harmed etc etc but then we have to engage in affection and appreciation and gratitude and love as the ultimate healer but we'll get there only if we take action steps right now to stop this brutal medieval criminal practice so i think i'll end with that and i thank you both for taking an initiative here and leading the way but let's get this out on social media as quickly as possible and ask people to send in their comments and also send their ideas on what can be done to harness our collective creativity to solve this problem Thank you very much. Thank you, Deepak. And and just to 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 tell this uh, conversation, um, we have partnered with Girl Generation. So the Chopra Foundation has entered in a, a long term partnership with Girl Generation and Dr. Leila Hussein here, and we are looking forward to building a community of and the soul of leadership, not only to bring tools to these girls and to empower them through so that they can break out of their trauma and empower others, but also educate the community, bring tools to them. So this is an ongoing partnership. This is a marriage because we believe in in a spiritual marriage here. This is our commitment to humanity. Uh, We need to go to a new level of collective consciousness. And, you know, there's an expression that I use quite often. It's a tiered joy. We need to transcend our pain through joy. And I know it sounds like an oxymoron, but there's actually a science behind that. You know, 
and and mm-hmm. so this mm-hmm. is where we're at today and and we 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 would love you all the listeners and the viewers to just join us ask questions go on girl generation website come on our website you want to participate volunteer support spread the word we will give you the toolkit that you need and we're in, and we're creating this we're co-creating this under Layla's leadership and Deepak's and this is just going to be an incredible journey because I always believe and there's an incredible quote that Deepak will probably correct me on because I always quote things wrong <laughs> but I love the the late philosopher Krishnamurti and he said until the the oh you see <laughs> I got the quote wrong but it's that moment when you realize that I am humanity is the greatest freedom of all. And I'm quoted him wrong and Deepak is going to recall me. But, but it's that moment where you realize <laughs> that you are responsible for all of humanity, then you're free. So okay. I think this is where we're going here. That's the energy and our commitment that we're bringing here. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Because you know what? We have to measure our lives as joy is the ultimate measure of success. And that's a Deepak quote. <laughs> that's a Deepak teaching. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. And uh, look forward to engaging more and getting rid of this brutal criminal practice. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you. Thank we will. You. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. So uh, Stop recording. I guess-